I'm Ross Kickle. In today's video, we're heading back over to see the boys at Top Shelf Aquatics. So before we bring out the main content, two good videos were released this past week. One of them, Bulk Reef Supply actually did some tests with salt water in storage containers, holding it over time, where basically, you know, they tested the parameters to see if there were, you know, we'll say drops or even increases in some of the parameters over days, weeks, kind of, you know, time frames, which is something that is really cool because to me, I always wanted to do that experiment, just never got around to it. So again, that's Bulk Reef Supply, their, their YouTube channel. Premium Aquatics also put a new video out on the new gyre, right? That three series where they got a new controller and all that fun stuff. And so again, Jeff did a real nice job in there as to kind of demoing it, et cetera. And again, uh, most of the people love the gyre. So if you're interested in seeing the new one, check that as well. It's Premium Aquatics, their YouTube channel. Now, as far as our main content goes, basically, again, Top Shelf Aquatics, and what we're going to talk about specifically are pests, right? Making sure that pests don't get into your main display. Um, ultimately, I've talked to many people who are, where they even quarantine, and they still have all these pests getting into their main display. Now, think about it. You've got Top Shelf Aquatics has been doing this for, you know, umpteen years, so to speak, and uh, they have massive systems that are worth, you know, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars kind of thing. And so... From their end of it, they want to make sure, number one, that nothing gets into their main displays. But number two, they have so many things coming in, right? They've seen pests that us normal hobbyists don't even, like, know exist. And so what's really cool is they kind of demonstrate their arsenal of, we'll just say, weapons, for the lack of a better word, to, to make sure that they eradicate any of those pests so, you know, before they put them in the holding system, um, you know, again, they're gone. And again, there are way more tools and um, instruments than I would have even thought, even as it relates to dips, right? Not just one dip, but many dips. And so, and again, they've been nice enough to kind of share how they do it at the shop. And again, um, when you look at it, I think there's uh, a lot to be learned from that video for everybody, right? Whether it's the new hobbyist or the experienced hobbyist. So let's spin up that video. And again, if you're looking for what I consider the best fish food on the planet, check it out at American Reef HPD. That's one word, AmericanReefHPD.com. Uh, you can pick it up over there. And again, let's go see Remy Nostin. Hey guys, Russ here. Hey, just a heads up, going forward through this video, you're going to have to adjust the audio up. Uh, basically, I had three audio tracks of which two got corrupt for some reason, so the only audio that was actually good was the one on the main camera. Um, again, it's still good. Problem is, you just got to adjust it up a little higher to hear what um, Remy, Austin, and Kevin are talking about. So that being said, again, hope you enjoy the video. Okay, so we've got a couple pieces that are in our holding facility right now, as far as acros go, um, and some of these we haven't removed the bases on. So these are all potential candidates, but before we can move them over or anything, we got to make sure they're all clean and good to go. And so we can remove the bases. We are literally taking. If I don't get a tag, my room found it. We're literally taking all of this base that this was grown off of and yep. removing it. Because that is a harbor, potential harbor for pests. Okay, well let's take, let's take this Blackbeard's treasure over here. Right. We got it. We're gonna take it to the saw. Um, depending on the type of piece, you know, it might be easy just to clip it off. But a lot of these larger maricultures, it generally benefits from having some sort of saw going. 
So I'm going to make sure this thing's ready to go. Generally, when you're cutting things, if the saw is clean and sterile beforehand, that generally minimizes a lot of risk, too. And if you don't have a diamond blade bandsaw at home, which I can understand not, uh, there are several tools that you can get, lots of either coral cutters. These are more for actual corals themselves. Something like this is great for chipping away rock work and bases to kind of minimize what's going into the system. And then if you can't get quite all of it off, that's when you'll seal over, just like we did with the Cyphastria, on the remaining parts of rock. Yeah. So something like these are definitely handy to have if you don't have access to a bandsaw. <laughs> I'm not sure a lot of people do. I was going to say, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people do. One thing we are a fan of doing over here is we like to have some sort of light on our fragging zone. You generally, we use like a blue because a lot of those pieces, they just floor us really nicely so we can get a better idea of where the eyes or the mouse are trying to cut around or separate on the piece R so that way we won't be intersecting with them. So assuming the saw is going to behave, looks like it is literally going to take the base I'm going to chop up pretty much as much as I can get around it initially, and then I'll go back and kind of fine tune it. If I chop too high, there'll be a bunch of multi branches on here, which is trying to keep it together to some degree. Alright, well, we got the piece cut, so obviously pieces can slime when they're like this. So we're going to rinse them off a little bit, shake them off, make sure we get a lot of that slime off. So the piece broke again in half. It will happen when you're cutting maricultures. So. Something that a lot of people don't realize is, yes, Americulture is a nice piece initially, but there's a lot more that goes into it if you really want to make it, you know, live long term and actually get good colors out of it and make sure it doesn't infest your whole entire system. So this is a common situation we will run into where you'll have the piece kind of divided into a couple pieces just because it's practical to cut it that way. The benefit is, though, that there is no non-living tissue on the piece. So now... We can guarantee that there are no eggs on this piece. And at this point, what we would do is run them through a bear dip to ensure that there are no more active pests if there were any to begin with. And this is again, assuming that, you know, we either just got this piece in or you as a hobbyist uh, received a piece from right. a store. This is something that you might want to do if you have any suspicions or, you know, no guarantees that it's pest free. And so, new hobbyist, he says, hey, I'm getting the base off there, right? Eggs are gonna be laying down there. And you do the bear dip, and the bear dip does what again? That's gonna <laughs> kill the active bugs. So active anything bug. that's, any, any sort of pests that are on there, you know? Okay. Uh, the, the parrots can be throughout the body of the piece too, potentially. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're gonna lay at the base though. Yeah. But they can work around the body. And depending on the type of you know organism, they can be pretty large. So they can move some can make some clearance on the piece as well. And so what's the ratio of the bear to tank water? We do ten milliliters to four ounces. Uh, okay. I mean when we do, you know, again on a larger scale, when we do it, um, it's in bins sure. you know, this big. So it's we, we go through a lot of bear. Yeah. Right. Um, but in a home setting, generally speaking, ten milliliters to four ounces is a pretty safe bet. Um, it's not gonna be too much as far as stressors to the acros or any other corals, but it's also gonna be a strong enough concentration to wipe out anything that might be on. So now remember this process too with the bear, we have a timed amount, we you know, allow the coral to sit in there and obviously the time period, we're going a little bit longer than normal, the time period between cutting the piece and putting it in the bear, we try to make it as short as possible because acros don't like to be out of water long term. So I'm gonna put these pieces in as we're talking here. Um, and in a home setting, use gloves with bear is always recommended. Yes. Uh, yeah. Some funny stuff that'll happen to your skin, especially yeah. with open cuts. <laughs> so always have eye protection and gloves as well. That's which I do not. <laughs> as you, as you set the example. We are, we are veterans. Uh, yes. yeah. Do not try this at home. Professionals at home. <laughs> so I've got the piece in here. You know, a lot of hobbyists, they may just put it in a small specimen container. Mm -hmm. um, either way, you know, 
after it's generally good to dip it throughout that time period of what we do for about 10 minutes. Um, so you go through there and baste it occasionally, or you can set up something a little bit larger and actually have a heater and a power head running in there too. Mm -hmm. That way it ensures that there's no temperature drop or, you know, we're, we're just trying to minimize or eliminate as many variables as possible. You know, so if it's a steady temperature from tank to dip to tank, that's one less stressor that the piece has to undergo. Sure. So it's always good to put a time, uh, timer on your phone as well. So it's another important thing to do, which we do all the time here. So, but as it's sitting in this container, I'm going to occasionally go through here and kind of base. Obviously, I can't really see what I'm doing, but if you were to have things in the piece, you know, by the time you're done dipping, you will see them flying around or accumulating on the bottom of the bare container. So you use that as a, almost kind of a dictation if you actually have a pest in there. Hmm. And approximately how long do they going to stand there? Uh, usually about 10 minutes at most. Ten minutes Nine minutes is the average that we use. Okay. Uh, when we're doing dips here in the store, we're using these large racks as well, so we like to give ourselves a minute to accommodate for the transition period. Got it. In case anything has to sit in there. Um, also, we usually have pieces on a rack, too, because a lot of these small pieces you might kind of lose mm -hmm. sticking your hand around in there trying to find them. So we try to give ourselves a little bit of a time Kind of Got it. Now, the reason for the extra water container here, after the pieces go through the dip, it's mm -hmm. super important to rinse the corals before they go back into the systems. You don't want to have any any sort of dip left on the skeleton or tissue that is going to be reintroduced into the system. Again, foreign contaminants are something that you always want to minimize. Makes sense. So we'll give it a couple stages of a rinse procedure. Mm -hmm. That way we can ensure that the only thing that's going back into the system is a fresh, clean, healthy pool. Makes sense. This piece is done curing, by the way. So as you can see, I can touch it no problem without getting my fingers stuck with glue. It's the great thing about accelerator. And so, in about a week, the tissue will start to grow right yep. over the glue, just like it was a rock. Yep. So I'm going to put this piece back since we're done with the demonstration. Oh, keep going. Do we want to show this one as well? This one's a, a, another good example. Uh, we've got a timer going as far as the uh, acro going for the dipping. But this is another good example. Like we mentioned uh, a little bit earlier about mushrooms, um, sometimes having things uh, burrowing into them. Some types of zoas, softies, uh, mushrooms and stuff like that, you know, you are going to get some rock on the piece as well. So it's a good practice when you get something on a frag like this redactus that you should go through and actually physically try to get as much rock removed as possible. So you can even go so far as to remove it from the plug entirely if yep. you, you know. Yeah, in this case, I'm going to remove it from the plug because there's enough separation. Obviously, when you're cutting things like shrooms, you got to be a little careful because you can tear the foot with the rocks coming apart. So we're going to try to do as much as we can, and then from there, we'll seal it up. So I can literally just separate this baby off to the side, put him there. So this is more kind of the route you'd be going, especially if you don't have a bandsaw at home. So, mix we'll get our Boston Aqua Farms coral cutters. Yes. Oh, John at Boston Aqua. Yeah. Now, why do you want to remove? Uh, again, this is more just a, a preventative measure mm -hmm. to ensure that there's nothing, you know, a lot of rock work is very porous. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible to look into every single crevice and make sure that there's nothing there mm -hmm. short of, you know, using these kind of jeweler's glasses that we have. Um, but it's, it's more of a preventative to make sure that the chance of something being in there is as low yeah. as possible. You have to remember a lot of your common pests too, that a lot of people get annoyed with, like for example, Aptasia. This is a very easy and very common way they get into your system. So now- the Bottom of a frag plug or yeah. a rock. Yeah. Now, and right. something like Aptasia, for example, we don't have any form of dip that we have discovered yet, or I don't think in the hobby even, um, that will kill Aptasia. Right. Now, people talk about things like, you know, you can use the Aptasia X and whatnot or Joe's juice and whatnot, but you can't physically dip your whole coral in those. Right. So you wouldn't want to do that, or at least personally I wouldn't. Um, 
you know, so doing things like this on a lot of your softies, pieces that definitely have rock on them, can it minimize things like the aptages, different types of worms we were talking about. Uh, Asterina stars. Asterina stars are another And a lot of different one. kinds of algaes too. Yep. Sure. That are rooted into the rock that you're not necessarily going to be able to either pick off or, you know, even notice initially. Sure, sure. So since this mushroom's pretty good, I mean, we got most of it on here. So you can see there's a tad bit left on here, but we have to remember with a mushroom, we go too deep, we're gonna start inf you know, infringing upon its actual foot base and potentially stress it even more. So a lot of these things we do are going to add a layer of stress to the piece. So if it's already super stressed, you don't wanna cause its demise by trying to help it. So since it's a, mat it's a mushroom, I'm gonna just stick it on disc since it will fill this out over time. On this piece, I can kind of go in. It's a little slimy on my hands. I can kind of go in and uh, we have a different type. The little BSI glues are really good for this kind of stuff um, because you can kind of go in and more fine detailed with smaller amounts and kind of seal them up really easily. So you do the pancake method. I apply the frag plug to the plug, flip it over. Try to get as much as I can. You know, like something like this too, I could RX it before I actually seal it up as well would always be a good thing to do. We always recommend to do the dip before um, any sealing. This is clean water. So I can put that piece in here, shake it off a little bit, make sure there's no bubbles forming on the piece and give it a couple minutes to cure here while we're waiting for the other actor to be done. Yeah, I got a little baby so I can get that on a frag plug as well. And do you care about getting the accelerant on the mushroom? Yes, actually the accelerant, um, what we've noticed is it can cause, it, it'll form almost like a film mm -hmm. over top of the tissue of the coral, and that can be super, super stressful and cause tissue loss. So what we'll do is again, we'll take our magical handy dandy baster, and as soon as this starts happening, you can see the bubbles kind of forming with the glue and stuff like that. You just give it a little bit of a paste, and all that stuff comes right off. Yeah, if the, if the accelerator sits on the piece for a long, you know, more than a couple seconds, it can be stressful. Yeah. So certain types of corals are obviously going to be more, you know, comfortable with it than others. And that's really when you're dealing with SPS. Those are the ones yeah. that are very intolerant of uh, of things like that, or again, outside contaminants. Yeah. So. I know I got some on the top of that one, but it's a mushroom, so it should be okay. A good practice is to apply it from the side, and generally it'll start curing up, and as you can see, it might be hard to get on camera. It's actually starting to solidify the glue around the piece here. But all it takes is a little drop. And again, shake it off to prevent air bubbles from stagnating. Because corals don't like air. Sometimes you'll get little bubbles that appear on the sides of the frag as it's curing. Mm -hmm. uh, you can either remove them right then or you can pop them off as they cure and you know, salt seal up. Makes it a little bit easier. So that is more of kind of like an aesthetics thing as well. You don't want a giant glue bubble just hanging in there. So, sure. But. All right, so we're running up what's left on the timer for the yeah, yeah. there. Now, as far as kind of general pests in the dipping, um, what are some of the weirdest pests that you've come across? Oh man, well, uh, those worms that we found in the Ghanio forest uh -huh. yeah. were very interesting because they were colored the same as, as every species of Ghani. That they, there was a red Ghani, the worm was uh -huh. red. There was a green Ghani, the worm was green. But the way they tunneled through the skeleton, you know, it it wasn't entirely obvious while the polyps were extended because you know it's a long wavy sure. thing, and we just sort of noticed the tissue receding from the bottom. We gave it a quick dip and this really long, funky looking green worm came sure. out. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Sure. Another, another common thing is like I mentioned before is there's actually quite a few different nudibranchs that a lot of people don't think about. Sure. Um, and a very common one we actually find in the store is 
with new shipments is actually alveoporous. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. Realize that. Um, they look very similar to kind of almost like a burgi or something. They're kind of just white on that species. So right. there's nothing too fancy on them. Uh, star polyps will get them too, and they look a little bit like the star polyps themselves. Right. Sun coral was another one. Those ones look really cool because they're bright orange. And right. Cool. And that's what you'll see with nudibranchs a lot of the times is they mimic other things or a lot of the times they'll mimic the thing that they prey on right. so that they are a lot harder to detect right. and they right. have a bit more of a food source readily yeah. available. Another yeah. thing we have found that uh, a lot of people get scared on the internet about um, bobbit worms or unicid worms, um, they actually are pretty common. Uh, you'll find them a lot with your larger zoa rocks and stuff. Okay. So sometimes things that we get shipped in from like Vietnam for example. Sure. Or, like we have those in the rocks, generally if we dip them from the beginning, you'll actually kind of see them wiggling around, getting irritated, but they may not actually come out of the rock right away. Sure. So, and basting. Well, yep, well, basting is a big part of it, but a lot of people, you know, when they first come into this hobby, they want big pieces to right. pull out space in their tank. So they'll look at these big combo rocks or big pieces of zoas, and then, you know, you get a unicid worm in there, and it just kind of grows over time. Um, now, they may not get six feet in length and eat your fish or anything, but those types of worms do feed on corals too. So you will see zoas kind of diminish over time, or they might start eating on your lots of corals. Right, right, right. Um, and you're not going to necessarily see it because they're very nocturnal, mm -hmm. they're very secretive, so they're basically just moving through the rocks. They're not yeah. going to be out in the open. Unless you are one of those people like me who likes to go to their tank at night time yeah, yeah. and find a flashlight. Yep. Try yep. to find stuff crawling around at night. Dude, that's yeah. right. So Absolutely. that's that's one of the ones. Uh, sea spiders are another kind of crazy one. Yeah. They're not fun. Uh, they're they can be pretty optimistic or opportunistic as far as what they're going to eat. Um, some might specifically only just tackle LPS, but it's all LPS, you know. Um, and we found with a lot of those that just starts from visual inspection right off the front. You know, right. if we can kind of combat it and RX dip it a couple times. Um, to really ensure that they're not going to live, then generally we find that it's sufficient enough to kind of keep them from spreading or you know actually reproducing again. Um, but we have found that not a lot of fish necessarily will go after them. We've tried right. several different races and stuff. Um, these are all things we like to keep in the quarantine tanks too, certain sorts of workhorse fish and inverts. Uh, but nobody seems to really go for the sea spiders, so that's something yeah. you have to keep in mind. And it's, again, you know, for a new hobbyist especially, this is. This is why, you know, visual inspections, if something looks a little funny, dip it. Right. You know, yep. I mean, it's it all comes down to, to preventative measures. Well, so you guys had mentioned the visual inspections. You got some visual tools. What, what are the visual tools? So here we've got what's basically a set of jeweler's goggles. Okay. Uh, and what I'll do with these, I will basically take an acro or some other kind of coral and I will look through literally every single piece of this until I can find either no trace of eggs or absolutely uh, <laughs> definitive proof of eggs. But these have magnification up to 25 times. Okay. So it lets me see all the pests that are uh, absolutely uh, too small to just sort of recognize. Got it. Uh, it also is really helpful in situations where you're looking for things like bite marks. Um, and bite marks are a mm -hmm. very early indicator of coral pests. Okay. Uh, generally speaking with Acropora and Montipora, you'll see it a lot. Okay. Um, with softies, generally the polyps will sort of either start to shrivel up, close up, or separate. And mm -hmm. actually, you'll see it with zoas, they'll, you'll have one that just kind of pops off or sort of floats around. Right, right. A lot of the times that's due to coral pests or in general stress. Uh, zopox is something that people might run across and that's where your zoanthids will literally have white spots all over them. Right. But it's actually a new growth um, and we found here that you can take a scalpel like this and literally go underneath the tissue of a zoa of, that has zopox that's mm -hmm. infected and the whole tissue skin, it's like right, a mat, right. all it's just rich, peel yeah. away and then the healthy zoas and the uninfected ones are, uh, assuming they're still alive, are underneath that and right. ready to start growing again. So right, that's something right. that we found that, you know, previously, uh, you know, a lot of people had trouble combating that, but we found a pretty effective method to do that right. uh, with manual removal, which oh, is the case with a lot of these kind of 
either fungal or uh, algae problems. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Bacterial issues. As Bacterial, well. absolutely. I mean, that's another reason that we use the iodine and the RX. Yep. Uh, RX does function as an antibacterial as well. Yep. So a lot of people don't understand, realize that, but it does help. So very important. So, all right. So, timers. Pretty much, we've been for here for about ten minutes with this piece. Um, we're not too worried with it going a few minutes longer because we know this piece has been pretty healthy. Um, that is something to mention when you are first getting a piece in a store, always try to go for the healthiest pieces. Don't go, go for something that's looking questionable just because it's you know, a piece that has value because you may just lose it in this whole quarantine process. So define healthier looking. Well, this piece is a Blackbeard's treasure, so it kind of has more of a goldish, rusty brown color to it normally. But let's say you have like a really popular, you know, like some sort of rainbow acro that's known for certain colors and it's very colored down. Or this the shape of the skeleton and the axial polyps on it are actually kind of rounded and it almost looks like smooth skin on it. That's generally a sign that something's going on with it. So if you're starting with a piece in that condition, you're removing from the environment that's in and then doing all these things on top of that, there's very likelihood that you could cause its demise as well. So. It's a little bit of a different game, you know, getting pieces online and stuff, but when you're in a store, always try to go for a healthy piece first. It always comes back to visual inspection. Yes. There it is. Yep. So this piece has been in the bayer, you know, I've shaken it off quite a bit here. Um, and what we're going to do now is I have two rinse containers. Um, generally, we always do at least two, sometimes three on the piece to ensure that none of the bayer is stagnating on the skin or anything. And obviously, I'm going to shake it here one last time to make sure any last pest. There because are again, any. that's something you don't want to reintroduce into the system. <laughs> so I'm going to shake it off in one, pretty heavily. I think I'll let it sit. You know, generally this part we like to do with the power head if we can. Um, you know, we're usually doing larger scale amounts. And uh, another reason for the power head being in there too is a lot of these pests don't just come off of the corals when they're sitting in the dip. I mean, if you're sitting in still water, they can just either move around or crawl to a different piece. If you're basing them off constantly or have a power head that's circulating them, they don't have a chance to really secure a foothold on the corals. They're in the bar having a drink. They're getting drunk <laughs> and then the tornado comes through right, and blows them out. Right, that's how you gotta right. think of it. <laughs> they're in the bar. Beachside bar. That's yeah, right. That's that's right. right. washed out. <laughs> so I'm going to put them through the second rinse to really ensure that they're clean of the bear at this point. Because we do not want to reintroduce or introduce bear into your system and have it stagnating in the water. So have you ever introduced bear into your system? No. Do a water change if you do. <laughs> An okay. accident. But yeah, if you do, run definitely run some carbon and do a water change. Yeah, it's... Uh, Preferably keep the bear away from your tank. <laughs> we like to have, as you can see, we're dipping over here. We usually do it over the counters here. There's plenty of space. If that was to even splash, that it's not going to get on any of these tanks. Yes. I wouldn't recommend doing bear dips on top of your aquarium. Let's just put <laughs> it's that a out. bad idea. Yeah. So, and obviously, yes, I put gloves on when I'm working in the bear because the reactions you can get on your skin are not fun. Yeah. So both can personally that, testify yeah. to that. Very <laughs> questionable. <laughs> So I've got the piece rinsed off. Now I'm going to get another disc here. And we're going to just take the multiple pieces of this piece and we're going to glue them together, seal up all the bottom sides, and just put them on one disc because it'll be a little bit easier to track. And again, John from Boston Aqua Farms disc. Yep. There you go. He's our guy. So a lot of times when we glue in general, also with fragging, we like to dry off the bases a little bit because it makes the glue kind of seal a little bit better. go over this. This part I'm not going to make contact with the frag plug, but I would prefer, since it's in a weakened state, it may not heal over this as quickly. So I'm going to actually glue over that to make sure not any algaes or anything are going to bore up on it. Or if there are pests in the system so they can't lay any eggs there. On that bare skin, yeah. So I'm going to apply a little accelerator to the plug here, and then I'm just going to stick it on. We have various methods as far as applying the glue. You know, do you want to glue the plug first or the frag first and then the accelerator it all kind of varies this has been more of the method we've been doing lately is apply the glue to the base of the piece apply a little accelerator to the plug and then let it cure that way 
just to be incredibly thorough sure. and ensure that no exposed skeleton is ever in the system. Sure. And obviously, like we said before, we try to keep the time period on this thing kind of like smooth transition overall. So minimize the amount of stress that the piece is going to get on it. If we drag this out, we'll definitely have losses. Now, it is important to mention that we find that most corals are going to be fine with bare, but certain types aren't going to be able to tolerate, you know, up to the 10 minute mark or as lethal of a concentration as we use in general. For example, uh, your smooth skin acros, your economic sure. type acros, stuff like that. Uh, oh, gosh, yeah. Any of those bottle brush types, they don't do as well with that kind of concentration. Some types of chalices as well, we found, they don't seem to like it at that concentration either. So we generally, you know, might do three quarters of the dose or half the dose. Sure. Um, and we'll also cut back the time frame a little bit. Now, yes, you can run into potentially introducing those pests, but for thorough inspection and quarantine the piece, we're gonna to try to eliminate that as much as possible. And at that point, we usually increase the frequency of the dips instead of doing it every yes. seven days, mm -hmm. we do it every five days just mm -hmm. to ensure that the life cycle isn't getting, you know, missed yeah. or, uh, or, you know, at all altered or more stressed out. Sure. Of the piece. Yeah. So we're going to go in here and make sure that all these pieces are sealed up. No exposed dead tissue. So I've got that all sealed up on this. I'm going to put a little bit more accelerator from Boston Aqua Farms on here. sure everything's sealed and then I'm going to put this piece back in the system. Now the important thing to do as well as we talked about before the piece is subject to getting some bubbles on it yep. while securing like this. So we like to make sure you know, it's going to get some good flow over it and obviously get the proper requirements as it would generally need. But the flow especially, so nothing's settling on it. Really well. But uh, overall, I mean, that's the process that we go through for, for dips and quarantines. Um, you know, in general, again, it always comes down to thorough visual inspections mm -hmm. and uh, preventative measures as far as making sure that you're not introducing anything that shouldn't be there into your system. And so now, from a, from a home hobbyist standpoint, once you do that one time, are you done? <laughs> Until you reintroduce another piece, potentially. Right. Um, you know, it's not just a, a one-time cure-all thing. It's, you know, especially if you do have the pests and you see them, you go through one dip, you, you're going to want to do at least a couple weeks of that. Right. Um, just to ensure, again, that there's no way that anything got missed, that anything laid any eggs, that maybe you missed an egg while you were sealing and it hatched. Sure. If you just did one dip and you missed a patch of eggs and they all hatch, well, sure. you're back to square one. Sure. So, yeah, so this is why a big part of why we really always reiterate that if you can do it, always have a separate quarantine. Absolutely. For fish and corals. Some people like myself, we figured out ways, you know, if you just use prize pearl on fish, you can alternate between the fishing and corals or at the same time. Um, but, you know, generally, a lot of people see it as quarantine fish is important. Right. Do both. Do both. Always Absolutely. find a way to do both, or at least the corals, personally, for me. And but, especially once you've gotten to the point where, you know, you have an established reef, you don't want to see that work go to waste. You don't want to see it go down the drain. Yeah. You want to see it continue to grow, and you want to keep adding to it. Right. The yeah. only way to really do that, and have the peace of mind that you're going to be successful is to be thorough with your inspections and your quarantines. Right. And Nahoda, you had two other dips there with, that we didn't use. Why do you use those dips instead? Those are, uh, again, the, uh, the Coral RX is, is more of a, an antibacterial. Uh, mm -hmm. We will use that when we're transferring from a quarantine system into another quarantine system or into the actual farm systems. Mm -hmm. um, again, as a preventative to make sure that nothing's entering these pristinely clean systems that we have worked so hard to uh, keep pest free. This uh, is a very popular type that a lot of people use though. Um, it is a really good irritant for a lot of those common pests. So like 
to different types of prism worms, certain nudibranchs, Astrina stars, for example, uh, even amphipods. You know, not all of them are necessarily bad, but some will leak holes mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, copepods too. This is a really great irritant. You know, this is at least the one thing you should have in your arsenal of tools, um, because a lot of those common problem pests, um, even those gonopora worms we were talking about, mm -hmm. we can pretty much eradicate most of their initial population with just this. Putting them in a you know body of water that has the RX in it and basting it pretty aggressively within that time frame, we can eliminate a lot of those and slough off. You know, if you have a multi-stage you know process with your quarantine, then you're going to be able to eradicate the new you know parents and you break the egg cycle as well. But this stuff makes a huge difference. You know, we try to get all our customers doing at least this as the bare minimum yeah. for any piece they put in their tank. You know, you can literally stick this in a frag bag couple drops worth, shake it up pretty aggressively, and then it rinse it off in a separate container and put it in the system. Got it. Bare minimal, you know. Got it. That's, That's the for... simplest method of quarantining, I guess you could say. Huh. As for the reef dip, a lot of, you heard us talking earlier about how certain corals don't react as well to the bear. Right. Um, if it's a little bit more stressful, iodine is something that kills a lot of different pests and is also a lot less stressful on different types of and different species in corals. So if something can't really go through the Bayer process, you can at least be confident that you can put it through an iodine process and um, you know at least eliminate the pest that way and cause significantly less stress. Of course. Got it. So in other words, those are three different dips that you use here. You use the Bayer for certain acros, etc. But then you can use the other ones depending on the types of corals that you have. Exactly. Yep. And a, a couple others to mention is, you know, there's mm -hmm. certain cures for like pest allergies. Mm -hmm. Like fluconazole people are using for paralysis. Um, and you're also using uh, Vibrant. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people use those in tank in their displays. Mm -hmm. We're more of a proponent of trying to do that in quarantine as well. Right. It's a great opportunity to use that stuff and not potentially stress other pieces yeah. out. Yeah, or right. chemi-clean too. Yep. A small 24-hour chemi-clean bath in a separate container can do wonders for a lot of softies. Right. Yeah, you know, Zola's clove polyps. Clove polyps especially, yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially with the first introduction, just simply transferring from one tank to another, they can get stressed. It'll break off a lot of those bacteria they can build up. That's what I was going to say in general. Um, do you find that basically treating softies is more difficult than kind of your so stonies LPS? Or? I would disagree to a point. I yeah. mean, it's, it's harder to say because, you know, we have the acros and the SPS down to a science. I right. mean, this is, it's a very streamlined process, but with, uh, with softies, a lot of the times, like Austin was saying, They'll be, you know, the pests themselves will be bored so far into the rock that you either can't see it or the dips, you know, the, the circulation doesn't quite get useless. through. Right, yeah, exactly. Right, right. So it can be a little bit more challenging sometimes, but at the same time, you know, it is it can be just as challenging to go through and, you know, with a 25 times <laughs> magnification lens looking for eggs that are this big, you know, right. can yeah. definitely be a trick. You also thing. have to remember that there's a demand from the hobby on things like SPS that we're putting that as a priority. Absolutely. And certain things, like I've mentioned before, we rely on getting wild collected. We may not be as aggressive with doing as intensive of a quarantine because we're not planning to farm them. A lot of people just want big chunks of zoos or big chunks of star pops. There could be a menagerie of different pests that could either be you know, directly affecting that coral or something else in your tank potentially. Just because of all that rock that comes with those pieces. Sure. So that's why we're always a big proponent of, you know, trying to seal up any of that rock. Sure, so. sure. Well, good deal. So yeah. parting words of wisdom for the new hobbies. You guys have been doing this for a while, right? Yeah, yeah we've been doing this for several years. So. All right. Visual inspections. There it is. <laughs> I know we've said it a lot, but that is the absolute key. Looking for so, anything out of the norm. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're buying a piece and you know what it should look like and it's in your tank and it doesn't look like that, or it's, you know, a couple weeks later it's closed up or dip it. The more you hold yourself accountable in this hobby of your own actions, the better overall you will not only be as a hobbyist, but the more successful you will be. That's one of the biggest things I try to reiterate. You know, if you take on the per actions of, you know, quarantining your own stuff instead of just relying on every fish store, because every fish store works a little bit different too, but there's always a chance that something can come in. Yep. If you're taking that action upon yourself, you're always going to have better results. And you're going to learn more and appreciate it more as well. Ooh, I like that one. 
That's good. Don't rely on anybody else other than yourself, right? Yep. And you have only yourself to yep. blame. Yep, exactly. Right, I like that. Good deal. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.